Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the museum. Great to see all of you tonight. Thank you. It's great to have you here tonight. Thanks very much for coming. I'm John Holler. I'm the president and CEO of the museum. And I'm happy to welcome you tonight on behalf of our trustees and our staff, our members, and our amazing volunteers. We have a packed house tonight. And it's so good to see all of you, especially during vacation season in August. And here you all are. So thanks for spending some of your free time with us tonight. Let me just give you some of the important announcements for this evening. First of all, as many of you know, our revolutionaries Speaker Series is sponsored by Intel. This is the fourth year. Yes, bravo. Thank you very much to Intel for that. Uh, and tonight's event is also uh, made possible by Qualcomm. Someone calls, uh, us one, called us one day the uh, Switzerland of Silicon Valley. And that must be true, because if Intel and Qualcomm are both here tonight making this event possible, this must be Switzerland. So thank you very much. <laughs> To both of you, there are about six and a half billion connected mobile devices in the world right now. That equates to about one million smartphones alone being activated daily. And 66% of us told Time Magazine that we keep our mobile devices right next to our beds. So mobile is definitely fully integrated into society, and that's true worldwide. And those little devices that much of the world now carries are at the forefront of a societal revolution that may seem well developed, but in fact is just beginning. Dr. Paul Jacobs has a front row seat to this revolution, both as a distinguished and award-winning engineer and as the chairman and chief executive of Qualcomm. Although he is still a very young man, his career spans more than 20 years of research, innovation, executive leadership, and philanthropy. He personally holds several dozen patents in wireless technology. The most recent figure I've seen is 35. It could be more. And as an executive, he leads one of the world's most far-flung technology companies with a market value approaching $120 billion. He is UC Berkeley through and through. In June, Paul and his wife Stacy gave $20 million to launch the Jacobs Institute for Design Innovation in the College of Engineering at Berkeley. And tonight, he is here to explore what he has seen and helped lead in the computing revolution and to talk about his vision for the future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Jacobs. Let's take a step way back to your early career. And I'm interested in knowing about your early influences because you have devoted all of your time and energy to engineering at a very high level. But obviously, you didn't start there. So where did you start? Uh, skateboards, maybe? <laughs> I actually, I had, uh, when I was a kid, I, my first business was actually doing, selling skateboards to my friends. So that was where I actually first got a little sense of business. But um, my father ran, he was a professor, and then he ran a company, Linkabit, and before Qualcomm. And so he had uh, you know, a mainframe at the office, and he would always bring teletype home. And uh, you know, it, it was one of those, actually, I've, I've seen one downstairs. It was one that you, you know, plugged the uh, telephone into, and it had thermal paper, and we used to play adventure on it. And, but I learned to program basic there, and used to write my own games and stuff like that. So I started out, actually, very early on uh, programming. And, uh, and then I you know, at the company, I would go work over the summers. And one of the things that my dad did for me that was amazing was every summer, he would have me work in a different area of engineering. Hmm. So by the time I went to Berkeley, I had, I had literally done every kind of engineering except for IC process, which I actually ended up doing in the labs at, at Berkeley. But I, we, we were even designing our own integrated circuits at the time. We had done our own CAD software. Uh, for integrated circuits back then and, and so forth. So I really had this just huge, you know, opportunity to see all different kinds of engineering from a really early age. And, and you know, I, I give my father, you know, huge, huge credit for giving me those opportunities. Now, was it clear to you from the very beginning as you were trying on engineering, this was really your thing? Did it have such special appeal for you? Uh, actually, you know, I thought originally I was going to be a doctor. Hmm. And then I think it was eighth grade, I went into science class and they showed a film of somebody getting a lung removed or something like that. I 
promptly passed out. And I realized the doctor was, <coughs> I was going to be a different kind of doctor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, um, but yeah, I was really always into it. I mean, even in elementary school, you know, I have a picture. My, uh, my dad did a, helped me build a little radio and did experiments about, you know, bouncing radio waves off of actually uh, cookie sheets and stuff. I mean, it was, you know, so I was kind of into all that stuff, I into math and science when I was a kid. And, and then just when the, when the computer came along, and it was almost like you, you know, you had your own little friend right there, you know, in front of you, and you just play with it. And when I finally realized I could make it do what I wanted it to do, you know, that was, that definitely led me into it. Hmm. Now, when I went to Berkeley, Though I, I thought, okay, I'm getting away from my parents a little. You know, we grew up in La Jolla, which is very different from Berkeley. And, and so I went up to Berkeley thinking I was going to more do robotics. And still, you know, you do control theory and you learn similar kinds of, um, you know, math and, and theory. And so that's what I thought I was going to do. But then when I was in, in school, uh, Challenger exploded and NASA lost a lot of its funding. Uh, then I went and did a, a postdoc in France for a year, and the Cold War ended, the wall came down, and DARPA lost a lot of its funding, and all of a sudden <laughs> robotics funding really dried up. Mm. So that's when I kind of said, okay, well, I'm going to come back and I'm going to go into communications and, mm. and really you know, go full time at, at Qualcomm, and, and turned out you know, obviously well, so it's a good decision. Was there ever a time when you thought about, you're really involved in startups now, and you, you're very much part of that whole startup ecosystem. Yeah. And I want to talk to you in a minute about what it's like to be chairman of Qualcomm and also have a hand in startups too. But did you ever think about a startup or something out on your own? I, I definitely thought about that. And, mm -hmm. and actually the time in kind of the 2004 time frame when uh, the company was trying to decide who was going to succeed Irwin, um, you know, we had an independent set of directors that went through the, the process the selection process, and you know, I wasn't sure they were going to choose me. It was a hard choice because they could easily get accused of nepotism, and if things had gone wrong, you know, people would have really gotten gotten down on them. But you know, I I I, I decided to you know that I wanted to go for it, and, and I thought you know I could go out and do a startup. And in fact, I said to them, you know, if you don't choose me, that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave. I'll I'll go do a startup and. So it was, an, I mean, I kind of was in a win-win situation. But in the end, I realized Qualcomm was this incredible platform because I believed from the very beginning that, that wireless was going to have this huge impact on the world. Um, and just to have that kind of a platform for your ideas and to be able to organize people together to create a, the next new technology, the next new innovation, next new product, I mean, that was so appealing to me that I just said, I can do it inside the company, but now I've got to make sure that the company feels to all the employees, including myself, that it still feels like a startup. Hmm. So that's why we do all the, you know, we have all sorts of crazy projects inside the company, a very broad range of things, even though the two main businesses are, you know, really around cellular. It's the chipset business and the licensing business, and these things all kind of feed into them, and so it gives me the same sense of, being involved in a lot of startups, and I think the employees feel that way too. So let's go back to 1990 when you first joined Qualcomm. Those were early, early days in mobile technology. Qualcomm, a company founded by seven people, including your father, Irwin, um, really catching that wave at just the right moment. But in 1990, there are a lot of people in this room who are still wearing beepers on their belts, right? And digital technology in the air was not happening at that point. So talk about what those days were like, because even though 1990 doesn't seem like that long ago, it was the Stone Age in mobile terms yeah. in many ways. Well, you know what was interesting is at Linkabit, a bunch of the guys had done the first TDMA system, Time Division Multiple Access System. And then when they came to Qualcomm, uh, you know, the, the famous story is that we were building a CDMA system for a satellite system, and Irwin and another guy, Klein Gilhausen, were driving down from LA after doing a presentation and realized, you know, if you control the power to a cellular base station, you can actually make CDMA work. And lots of people said that it wouldn't work and you couldn't do the power control and all this kind of stuff, and they, they figured out how to, 
how to do that. And that was really happening over that time frame. And then I came back and I actually worked on the speech compression algorithm. And what was interesting for that was that my little group was really the set of people that looked at the system, the radio system as a pipe. And everybody else in the company was there thinking about the radio system as how, you know, how do we get the most number of bits through the air and you know, packets and what, you know, how, do we, how do we characterize the quality of the system. And we were the ones that looked at it as an application, you know, the, the voice was an application on top. And so it was very natural after doing that to also think about data. And we had a guy, Phil Karn, that was you know, a guy that worked a lot on the internet, and he had uh, built a protocol that ran on top, of the, on top of the radio system, but below TCP and IP, that just gave us a low enough error rate that you could run TCP IP across it. So then we realized, hey, let's put the internet protocols into the phone. And this was, this was you know, very early on in the 90s. Well, I was gonna say, this was early 90s, first very half, early, right? Yeah. 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 90, probably two or something like that, that we decided to do all of this stuff. And then what happened was the wireless operators, they didn't care about this. So we'd show off this stuff and they'd be like, who wants that? You know, give me a dial-up modem service so people can dial up AOL. That's the best that they wanted. So what we did was we took the internet protocols in the middle, we stuck a little application on the phone that looked like, you know, the Hayes command set interpreter, and then we put a modem bank in the network, and then the next year we just took all that stuff off, put a browser on the phone, and, you know, and there we were off to the races. And then it finally launched in, I mean, it was probably 90, what was it, 97 kind of time frame, maybe that, yeah. you know, we really launched yeah. that stuff, but. So, you're deeply, deeply into this, and part of my job is to be the guy who takes things like TDMA and CDMA and unpacks it for an audience right. that may not know what, what those are. No, 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 I just, I, I just want to go back to that point in particular because you talked about how the network companies, the ones we were all trying to use for mobile communications, weren't interested in what, in what you were trying to do with this new way of distributing communications over the air. Talk, can you talk about that and, and how, how sure. challenging it was? To, because the reason this is important is that it enabled everything that we're experiencing oh, yeah. today, and it was a critical moment in history. It, it, it really was. So what had happened was, you know, you had these analog systems. You know, everybody remembers those. It has, you know, static and all this didn't really work that well. And they were running out of capacity on those systems. I remember seeing PowerPoints with, you know, brick walls on them and the capacity going up in the brick wall there. And, and so they, the industry actually did a competition to improve the capacity of the system, and they asked for a 10 times improvement. 10 times. 10 times. But what had happened was people came up with a TDMA system, and they were competing against another type of system, not CDMA, um, and uh, the TDMA system won. It won this competition. And what TDMA is, is basically it's you, you divide the time up into chunks, and you transmit and receive at a certain time, and then somebody else transmits and receives at another time, and so on and so forth. Right. And, uh, and anyway, so they only got three times. And the system, you know, it didn't exactly get three times, and the voice quality really wasn't that great because the speech compression algorithm wasn't so good. And we, you know, with this uh, drive down from, uh, from Los Angeles, a uh, client actually did some original calculation that came up with like 70 times or something. And we actually have this in, in our museum, this paper that he wrote, he said, you know, if these numbers even turn out to be close, this could be an interesting business. <laughs> I've so, seen that piece of paper, yeah, yeah it's, it's terrific. <laughs> Very nice understatement. Yeah. So anyway, so we, we then started in on, on building CDMA, and I think, uh, you know, people argued about what the, what the uh, capacity gains would be, and in fact, people argued that it wouldn't ever work, and wouldn't scale, and things would blow up, or you needed, you know, a uh, size of a van to carry the, the technology around in, um, and, uh, and also the voice quality. So I was doing the speech compression, and we were doing an eight kilobit per second speech coder, and I knew every time I called my wife on the system, she'd be like, oh, you're calling on that CDMA system again, it sounds terrible. <laughs> That's and, the key. Yeah. When she says, boy, that sounds terrible, you know you've got no, an you issue. Gotta, you gotta fix it. Yeah, and by right. the way, the TDMA system sounded bad at the same, you know, at that time too, and our design goal was to just be that good. Mm. And so I, I actually, I, I went into my father and I went into some of the other guys and I said, you know, we gotta make this better. 
So I started out thinking we were going to do you know, two channels, and we were going to cut the capacity in half. And of course, all these people who were working on the capacity of the system were pulling their hair out. Like, you can't do that. We have to get 10 times or better. And I said, no, this thing actually has to sound good. And uh, so we, we ended up with a compromise. We did like a 13 kilobit uh, vocoder and took the capacity of the system down a little. But then it actually sounded perfect. It really sounded beautiful, much better than, you know, than any other telephone system because it was all digital and just, you know, you'd, you'd get a few blips every so often because it was radio still, but, but really we could cover that up well and we, we did things like we'd suppress the background noise and it was all variable rate and very sophisticated stuff. Mm. And, and that was fun because then everybody was coming into my lab and getting the demos because, you know, when they weren't able to just drive around in the van. So, I, you know, very early age, I got to see all of the key leaders of the telecom industry were coming into my lab, and I was pretty young at the time, and I was giving them all the demos on, on this thing, and so, so that was tremendous fun, but there was, at the time, then a bunch of the industry had already decided, well, we went through this competition already, we chose TDMA, yeah, it's only three times, but it'll get better, so we're going that way, and then there were the set of the companies that had backed the competing standard, and they were mad that they lost, yeah. and they're like, hey, this CDMA stuff, that's great. And so we were going through all these competitions back and forth, and I mean, it really was literally a holy war, and people were just throwing around all sorts of invective, and, and honestly, I mean... And most of this was happening in Washington, right? Because oh, well, that happened, the policy discussion was happening there. Certainly in Washington, but it happened in the CTIA, so the Cellular Telephone Industry Association, yes, so the yeah. carriers organization, and then there were standards bodies, so I actually ended up going and doing the standards. That was another thing that sort of trained me to do business, was walking in as an engineer into a standards body thinking the best technology wins and realizing that it's a very political process and you've got to get your consortium of companies over here to support you versus these guys, and these guys would do procedural things to stop things. Any, anyway, so, you know, we, 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 so we, were, we were fighting through those battles too, and that was the thing where, you know, Everybody thought it was glamorous because you got to travel to different places around the world and do standards and stuff like that, but it was, it was a pretty brutal battle to, to do that. And then, you know, it persisted for a very long time. I and mean, it really was only, I would say, after I took over uh, in 05 that we healed some of the wounds of that, those battles of the, of the 90s, basically, mm. that people, some of the operators still didn't like us, they thought we were the enemy, when in fact the business model is actually quite aligned with the operator's business model, but um, they thought that somehow we were there to kind of take them down and disintermediate or you know, do things to them. And, uh, and we managed to kind of go through and solve those problems. But, it, but it, it, it was, we thought of it as a holy war. I mean, it really was one of those things where everybody was just so focused and committed to getting this technology out there and you just, you know, we would demo anywhere, anybody asked for a demo, we would send people there and vans and all sorts of stuff. And it was, I think the, the best, best part of it was, uh, it was a company in uh, one of the Baby Bells, Ameritech. And we knew that we had won when they did, uh, to the YMCA song sound, they did CDMA. <laughs> Hilarious. That's great. Said, okay, that's good. Now we have allies. Yeah. They've embarrassed themselves sufficiently. They have to be with us. <laughs> so here you are, still a young engineer, and as you, you just sort of said, I thought the best technology would always win. That's just the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. It, was this a bit of a rite of passage for you? Was this when you got a full view of the industry and you really began to see what this was all about? Oh, yeah. No, that was, that, you know, watching sort of the sets of consortia and the groups of people that were coming together in those standards bodies, and some people were, you know, you actually didn't even understand why some of the people were taking positions they'd take until you kind of decoded all the in intricacies of who their alliances were, and then you'd have consultants that would come in, and sometimes they were clearly <laughs> aligned with somebody, and sometimes not so clearly aligned, and so you kind of saw the whole range of, of, of motivations, and it, and it really was very, very instructive for me, and I mm. actually told other people who I sent afterwards, I said, you know, you're going to go in there thinking one way about the world, and you're going to come out realizing that it isn't the way you look at it on the surface, which is, by the way, a good lesson for all of us, that the world doesn't always work the way that we think it does on the surface. And, uh, and, and that happened. I mean, yeah. a lot of people came out of those. We actually trained a lot of the leaders of the company by going through that process and coming to the realization that 
having the best technology is, you know, we, that's how we win. But you also got to be great partners and you got to build alliances and you got to care what everybody else thinks so that you can align their interests and your interests. So as distinguished as the first generation of founders and um, the people instrumental in the company were, you are widely credited with being the one who had the vision for where mobile technology could ultimately lead. And, and you've been relentless in making that happen. Yeah. When did you first realize that mobile could be something better than just a great quality telephone call? Uh, I, I think right from the beginning, because as I said, I, we looked at the speech compression algorithm as an application of the system. And so, mm -hmm. because I had done all that programming early on, and I, you know, it's at Berkeley, I remember telling my wife one time, this was before everybody knew about the internet, and I was conversing with colleagues in a, in a lab in France, and I came home to her one day and I said, Stacy, you don't understand, there is this network that spans the world and everybody can use this thing and nobody knows about it. And it just connects everybody. And she kind of blew her mind. And of course, I didn't think of all the implications of it then. Of, I would not ever try and claim that. But I did when I got to Qualcomm, and there were a lot of other internet people there as well. You know, I started to think of it. This is a data transmission system. And we ought to think about what other things we can put on it. And so as we were doing the the vocoder work, we were even doing things like, uh, I did wireless local loop where you basically take a cellular phone and make it look like a desk phone, but we were doing things like even demodulating fax signals and sending faxes over the air because people cared about that back then right. and, and stuff like that. So we were always thinking about data transmission over the systems and then it really kind of hit me that this was the way it was going to happen. I mean, I, I just believed, I don't know why, but I just had this incredibly firm belief that this was the way the internet was going to get proliferated around the world. So I used to show slides that said wireless internet greater than internet, you know, and cell phones over here and computers over here and, and, and just got everybody to kind of buy into that. I mean, it took a little while, of yeah. course, but I got, I got people to buy into that. And, and I remember when we first did uh, the software downloading system, Brew, um, we went into Verizon and, um, they were, you know, they weren't about data. They were about voice, and that, that was how they were going to drive their ARPU. But I remember going back after the, we had gotten them to agree to do a trial, and they had downloaded, uh, the CEO had downloaded ringtones onto his phone. And he was like, Paul, check this out. I have the, you know, the Christmas carols on my phone. I go, okay, we won. Because <laughs> that, then, you know, he had to use the data system. And we were trying to get our high data rate system, it's called, you know, EVDO now, uh, out. And... Uh, and that was actually one of the things that once they downloaded stuff onto the phone, then you know, that kind of drove them in, into it. So, so there, were a lot of, there were a lot of sort of times when I felt something theoretically and then I had a visceral confirmation of it. And probably the best one, I would say, was after we did the Palm smartphone. And Sprint had just launched uh, the CDMA service in Hawaii and I went there on vacation and I was sitting on the beach and I had my Palm smartphone and I was using the AltaVista search engine, if you remember AltaVista. <laughs> and I typed in Maui Sushi and it came up and gave me a response that said this was the best sushi place on Maui and we went there and it was great sushi. And I said, you know, these non-connected devices, it's done. You have to have a connected device because it's so much more powerful to have the connectivity than to not have it. And so that was just a, you know, I had thought about it, but it really was a confirmation of, of that. And similar kinds of things happened, you know, with the GPS stuff. When we put the GPS into the phone, and then finally, you know, the carriers were very concerned early on that, you know, about location privacy and so forth. We finally got some location-based services in it. I, I remember we had um, an app that told me the, the uh, freeway speeds on the freeway exit, so I could tell when there was a traffic jam. I really, you know, you, you just, some of these things come through and you just realize, okay, that's, that's going to happen. Yeah. And then, then it's extrapolating from there. So then we started to realize the phone was going to be this thing where all of this stuff came into the cameras and, and the game console and the nav system. And, you know, the wallet hasn't quite really gotten in there yet, but we're still working on that one. But 
And I used to show slides like you know, the phone in the center and all these other kinds of devices around the outside saying, okay, this is all coming in. And you know, that happened. And much of it has. Yeah, it really has. How challenging was it to persuade other people early on that this is what was going to happen? It was funny. I mean, I used to come up here and give uh, talks at uh, like Always On or, no, yeah. it was Red Herring before. Yeah, the Red Herring Red Herring. And I remember I got up one day and I was saying how all this stuff was going to integrate into the phone and somebody in the audience said, oh, you say the cell phone's going to be the God box. That's not going to happen. Everybody thinks their device is going to be the God box. And I go, okay, fine. You know, we'll keep doing what we're doing. And then I said, and Wi-Fi, and I, and I was saying, you know, the computer was going to go into the phone too, and it was going to, the mobile was going to be disruptive to the, to the, uh, to the computer. And I said, oh, no, Wi-Fi, that's going to disrupt the cellular industry. And, you know, we always believed it was going to be complementary. And so, I, you know, I used to get people just giving me really hard time. And then also, you'd just talk to sort of average people, you know, normal people you'd run into at a dinner or a party or something, and they'd be like, stop putting so many features in your chips and into the phone because I can't use them all. You know, I just want to make phone calls on this thing. Maybe I'll send a couple of texts. But, you know, people, they were like almost angry that we were putting extra stuff in there. Yeah. And then, of course, that all changed once everybody got onto smartphones and, uh, you know, got to give a lot of credit to Apple for really creating a mainstream moment, like a <clears throat> crystallizing moment when all of a sudden everybody believed, oh, now I want lots of stuff in my phone. This is great. And, you know, they just did such a beautiful job of design and, and everything. Well, hence this quote, which you don't have to comment on, but I am going to say it. It's, uh, we were talking about it earlier. The Financial Times said after your keynote speech at the Consumer Elect Electronics show, Mr. Jacobs has done as much for the development of the smartphone as the late Steve Jobs. So you really are put there side by side with him and your company with Apple as making this ecosystem possible. So let's, let's talk about the ecosystem today. Let's talk about what you're doing today. And we're going to talk about the future in a second. What is the state of the art today and, and the competitive landscape that you're in? Okay. So um, right now, I mean, you know, we're back in that time when everybody cares about how much processing and graphics and all this kinds of stuff are going into the phone. I mean, we're selling phones around the world now where people care how many cores are in there. And you know, stuff that you would think wouldn't matter that much, and we had been through it on the PC side and kind of got past it, and, and now it's sort of come back again on the phone side. But you know, we're really, I mean, it's amazing the kind of speeds that you get, you know, we have I don't know, the 2.3, 2.4 gigahertz quad core <coughs> processors. We have, you know, the new graphics technology is 50% better than the last one. And it's going to do all the graphics that you expect to get out of, a, you know, your PC. And, um, you know, it's just amazing the amount of, of capability that's going into these devices. We just, we just certified our first phone with uh, the latest uh, Wi-Fi 802.11ac. And, you know, it's running single streams of... 300 megabits per second, and we have, you know, I just got uh, a new Nokia camera phone that has a Nokia Lumia that's got a 41 megapixel camera in it, and it's amazing. It was funny. I, I was, I was uh, just messing around with it, and the IT guy that was, uh, was working with me was standing across the room, and I took a picture of him, and then I, like, zoomed in, and I could zoom in on his fingernails, and he hadn't cut his fingernails. He got all embarrassed. I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> It was really very funny. I mean, the amount of resolution that you can get out of these things is just incredible. So, um, so I mean, the state of the state of play right now is already amazing to the point where, in the investment community, we were actually our stock price was getting depressed a little bit by the fact that people were saying, "Oh well, all the innovation's done. I mean, what else could there possibly be to go into a smartphone?" And I'm thinking, oh, "My God, we're spent." $4.5 billion on R&D last year. If I didn't have anything new, I, somebody should shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff. So we, we have started using all those things. People were complaining about you cramming into the phone that we weren't really going to need. Yeah. Um, how does R&D work for you? Uh, spending that level of money, what are the things that you're beginning to place those, those investments in? So um, obviously, you know, a fair chunk of it just goes towards you know, this chip and the next one and the next one and just the whole process of that and the software. I mean, we support so many different, we have over 500 designs in process right now. So there's a lot of money that just goes into the support of all those different 
customers and designs, and then we make all of our own cores. So we don't license, we license ARM's instruction set, but we make our own microprocessor, for example. We have multiple generations of modem technology, both on the wireless side, and, I mean, on the wide area wireless, as well as the local area wireless. We have, we make our own graphics cores. We bought the mobile part of ATI uh, from AMD, and so we have, you know, world leading graphics capabilities on that. We do all our multimedia stuff now, so video codecs. We now support Ultra HD, both playback and recording, so four times HD. Uh, stuff and that you'll get that first on a mobile device, which is kind of amazing. If it you is amazing. Think about that. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into um, kind of the core, just functionality of the phone, making it incrementally better. One of the new things that we did was we actually started doing uh, radio front ends now, and the reason is because with fourth generation. Governments are scrambling all around the world to find different frequency bands to free up for it. So there's like 40, I don't know, there was 47 or something like that, different bands of, of mm. frequencies that are possible uses for fourth generation. So we built a radio front end that can actually manage all those different things and so that the uh, manufacturers can make one device that can work across a broad number of operators. And, and so that, that kind of stuff's going on. Um, but then we're working on a lot of, lot of new things. We're working on display technology, for example. We, I really believe strongly that the phone is going to be an always-on thing going forward, meaning that when you take your phone out today and you put it down on the table, the screen's dead. It looks like the phone's off. But in fact, the phone is talking to the network. It's downloading stuff. It's, you know, there's all sorts of things going on. And maybe what you get is a little blinking light that might tell you, oh, a new email or a new message came in. But in fact, you know, I've actually used some of these things with always-on displays. And you know, if you're sitting in a meeting and you can actually see coming down who an email is from, then I can actually decide, is it important enough for me to interrupt or, or not, or just let it go? Whereas what most happens in meetings today is everybody picks their phone up every so often, kind of underneath the table, fiddles around with it. Yeah. And, you know, puts it back down. I've been in those meetings. Yeah, so, you know, so this way I think, you know, we'll, you, this kind of notion of always on I yeah. think is really important. And the other thing is that the display uses a lot of the power of the phone right now. A lot of the battery power of the phone is spent on display. So we really want to drive that down so that your phone can last a lot longer and, and so forth. So there's money that's going into that, and that's, that's a pretty big thing. Another huge thing is just, you know, this whole notion of redefining the way computing's done. So um, we've spent a lot of money, for example, supporting Windows RT, which hasn't yet turned into a great business for us, but I mean, we're still optimistic about mm -hmm. it, and I think, I think it will. <laughs> I, I am optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we're still investing in, in things like that, but we invest across all different operating systems. So you know, we, we basically support pretty much any operating system that's out there, because we're trying to be Switzerland, and whatever our customers want, we want to be there to support them for that. So that, that kind of stuff is going on. And then we have stuff that's you know, you know, way out there in the future. We're, we're building digital brains, for example. So we have uh, you know, models, the neurons, and these things actually work. I mean, they can see, they can find objects in the environment, they can actually do mo motor control. So, it's quite strange, but uh, we're actually going to have things that work like a human brain that you teach instead of program. So, let me, uh, but just before we get in, I'm going to explore that brain All right. subject in, in some detail here in a second. But let me just ask you, we're talking a lot about phones and not so much about tablets. Are, are, do you just assume that tablets are going to do all these things as well, these, yeah. the iPads and Android tablets and so on? Yeah, and, and you know, tablets has been something that we... Um, I think we were a slow starter in tablets. We were a little bit behind on some of the first generations of them, so we didn't, we didn't win those early uh, tablet designs. But now Nexus 7 just came out on our stuff, um, and we have 40 tablet designs right now in, in progress. So I think you'll see over this year that tablets will, you know, will do really well in tablets. And the tablets are getting all this kind of functionality too. Sure. Um, and the nice thing about tablets is, you know, you got a little bit more battery, so you can spend it on something. I mean, you can spend it on higher data rates, you can spend it on some more processing. Um, so, so I think tablets, 
great business. I believe very strongly in tablets. I think the cool thing also is that you know you see these different form factors where you have a tablet, but then you snap it into a keyboard and you basically replace your laptop. And and you know I I actually I haven't carried a laptop for a very long time anymore because what used to happen to me is like I'd get somewhere, I'd get off the plane. I'd open up my laptop to download my email and do my email, and you know, security was, IT was pushing me a security update. And so about half an hour later, after I got through all of that rigmarole, I finally could download an email and do it, and by then I was at the hotel. And what's going to happen in the future with the tablet is the tablet's going to be online all the time. So instead of the security update getting pushed to me during my uptime, it'll get pushed during my downtime, and it'll just be there, and then I'll say, yes, do it, and boom, it'll happen, mm -hmm. like your smartphone does. So, so for, if, for just that reason, I mean, I think it'll happen. But, but also, you know, it's such, it's such a valuable thing. We're doing things like augmented reality where you'll be able to walk down the street in a foreign country, for example, hold your phone up, it will translate the sign on the store or the restaurant and make it clickable. So stuff like that where you actually do want to use your devices outside and use it where you're moving around more, you know, I think those kinds of things will happen mm -hmm. too. And then just you know, just generally, just being able to use it whenever you want to. And, and the big issue there is we need to get the, the cost per bit down. And we have a whole initiative to try and inc increase the capacity of the networks by a thousand times and reduce the cost by somewhere around a thousand times cost per bit too. And that'll help out with people doing tablets on cellular as opposed to just doing it on Wi-Fi. Right. Let's talk about innovation just for a minute. Um, I was struck when a visitor walks into your offices in San Diego, the first thing that he or she sees is this wall of video screens all exhibiting patents and they're changing all the time. It's just an amazing amount of innovation and intellectual property that you're creating. What kind of culture have you encouraged to make this kind of innovation happen and, and what is your philosophy about that? It's, you know, it really is, the company doesn't have big factories and a lot of, you know, we don't have a lot of capital expenditure and, and so forth. Of course, we have buildings and things like that, but the company is about the people and their ideas. So first of all, the number one thing we do is treat the employees really well. And, you know, we're always on these best places to work lists and things like that, and we have great benefits and equity compensation that goes across the company and things like that. So people feel like they're they're an owner and they're part of the company, they want to drive it. The, the next thing is, whenever I get up in front of the employees at an all hands meeting, I say, you know, last quarter we shipped 172 million chipsets. If you have an idea that gets into those chipsets, you can impact 172 million people's lives in the span of three months. There's not a lot of opportunities like that in the world and it's an opportunity and it's a responsibility. So we need to think about what we're going to do with that platform to improve people's lives around the world. And that's very motivational to people because people want to be part of something bigger than themselves and they want to feel like they're doing something great and, and improving the state of the world. And so that's, that works too. And then kind of on the systems side, we um, obviously within the business units, they have you know, their standard processes and gate processes and product management and collecting input. And, and so that kind of incremental innovation more akin to, I think, what a lot of companies do. Um, in, the, in the corporate R&D function, which is a fairly large function for us, there's more of a curio curiosity-driven effect. Um, curiosity-driven. Yeah, meaning that people come up with ideas, they surface ideas, and that's how we decide, mm. okay, these are the projects that we're going to work on. But that's their job every day to go work on the next new innovations, whether it's digital brains or the next new radio technology or, you know, whatever, or broad range of other things that we work on. So they, they do that. And then we have um, an internal competition. So we do things where you can submit, anybody in the company submits ideas into a, a website and we actually have teams of experts that evaluate those things and people vote on them and there's discussions and in the end, we have uh, presentations. They get time off to go build prototypes and they come in and present. And the executive team, so the top people in the company, spend a day or half a day or a day listening to people come in and give you know, sort of a quick presentation. And, and this year, we had a lot of really interesting ones. And I would say almost, almost all of the 
finalists ended up getting into a business unit and being funded as a, mm. as a real project. And, and even things like you know, the augmented reality work that we did, uh, that we're doing now, came from one of these internal venture fests, and it didn't come from an engineer. It came from a guy in finance. That's who started that project. So it really, we try and give everybody in the company the sense that you have the opportunity to come up with an idea that literally can change the world. Mm. And so that works well. And then finally, there's the informal stuff, which is people just have time to you know, work on a project. And the way that we manage those, I think of those as like tiny little bubbles. And they're all over the place. And then when they expand, we can see them and manage them. The way they expand is, it's a good enough idea that their friends want to work on it too. And once you get a few sets of people working on it, then it becomes visible. And then we can kind of engage with them and say, okay, this is interesting, you want to submit it in here, or this is so interesting, let's jump on this and add more resources to it. So there's very, there, are, there are from very formal to very informal methods across the company. And then we try and motivate people also, just so that stuff isn't kind of wandering off. I mean, the way that I run the company is really by articulating a vision always. So the latest vision that we're working on is this vision of the digital sixth sense, which means that we're going to use the phone to augment our natural senses to perceive cyberspace around us to interface with you know, machine to machine. So sensors or services or anything in the world around us. And the phone's actually going to do that. It's going to merge cyberspace and real space for us. And so whether it's downloading content or controlling things in the environment or getting offers or getting into my car and having my car adjust to me just because I you know, got in it and things like that. I mean, all of these kinds of things are, are interesting and they can cause us to create new radio technologies, new software, new services, new products, just you know, a wide range of things. And so I articulate that vision. <coughs> Previous vision was the phone as the most personal device, not just for communications, but computing and entertainment and productivity, which led to a lot of the stuff that we're doing today. Mm -hmm. And so people know that's kind of where you head. And it's kind of like a compass, okay, we're, we're all heading in that direction, but I don't have to top down and say, you do this, you do this, you do this. People know, they say, from my vantage point, I see where we're heading and this is how I, I get there. And then we kind of manage the projects after that. Hmm. So it's a combination of organic and your vision. Yeah, I really the don't you've described. Yeah, I really try not to force a top down planning process. I mean, mm -hmm. we do planning, obviously, in, in, in the business units. And of course, you can't build a billion plus transistor chip without great plans. But for the most part, where the company moves to and the new technologies come from more following a vision than you must do this and you must do this and you must do that. Right. So let's talk about some of those specific things that are emerging from this digital sixth sense vision that you've talked about. You've put out the Tricorder X Prize, and for people who aren't Trekkies, we first need to start with what, what was the Tricorder on Star Trek and what did it do, and what do you see the real live Tricorder of the 21st century doing? Okay, so the, the Tricorder on Star Trek was the device that they would pass sort of over the person's body and it would diagnose whether they had something wrong with them and tell them what they needed to do to, to fix whatever you know, alien disease they had just contracted or, or whatever it was. And it actually came out of, I was, I was up here at a Churchill Club event with uh, John Rubenstein and Kara Swisher was interviewing us and we were talking about how all these phone things and tablets were so like Star Trek and said, well, what's next? And I said, oh, it's the tricorder. And then um, uh, Peter Diamandis of the XPRIZE Foundation, I, it was literally like two weeks later, he came down and he said, oh, we did this visioneering thing and we believe the tricorder is the next big project that we want to do an XPRIZE from. And I said, you know, this is just too much karma. You know, we, it's too much coincidence that we, we're both thinking the same way. So we agreed to fund that. And the reason why I wanted to do it was we'd been working in mobile health for a very long time. Probably, I would say, eight or nine years we've been working in mobile health. And it's just a very, very slow process because of the regulatory aspects of it and the medical industry moves kind of slowly anyways to adopt new technology. And I really wanted to create a, you know, kind of a, a catalyzing moment that would move mobile health from being sort of theoretical and fragmented into something that's very mainstream and understandable and cohesive. And there were a lot of companies, there's a lot of life science companies in, in San Diego 
So there are a lot of companies building sensors. There are a lot of people doing software and AI for decision support systems for medical things. And we wanted to bring this all together into a handheld thing. So the, the prize is around building a thing that's five pounds or less. And the idea is that you'll be able to diagnose uh, 15 different disease states better than a panel of doctors. And it's going to be in three and a half years there'll be the, uh, this competition. In the meantime, every year, Nokia sponsored a sensor uh, challenge. So there's going to be different challenges along the way for sensors. And I actually think, I think the prize will be won. And if you think about what it means now, in developed countries, you can imagine you know, your kid gets sick. You don't have to just take them to the emergency room. You'll actually be able to scan them figure out if they really need to go to the emergency room and take them in. Um, in the case of developing markets, you know, where you don't have enough healthcare professionals, a more lightly trained healthcare professional will be able to take this out into the field and diagnose people and send information back. And by the way, you know, stuff's happening along those lines mm -hmm. already. I mean, we're using camera phones, for example, in Egypt to do teledermatology. Somebody gets a rash, they take a picture of it, they send it back. Somebody diagnoses it, said, okay, you need to go get this and do this. And, and we're doing physical exams in, uh, in India now, reduce the cost from $10 for the exam down to $1 by using the cell phone. Optometry is another area that's it, being revolutionized. Doing that, yeah. We're, yeah, we're doing uh, cleft palate, doing speech therapy for people with the cleft, that have gone through cleft palate surgery. I mean, it's all, all sorts of wild things are going on in the healthcare space. The most wild one, by the way, is we're, we're actually uh, helped fund a clinical trial for a guy at Caltech that made a sensor that's small enough it'll go into your bloodstream. And what happens, about two weeks before you have a heart attack, cells start sloughing off and stuff starts floating around in your bloodstream. So two weeks before you have a heart attack, this sensor will be able to detect, or the theory is, and we're, we're working to prove that, sensor will be able to detect it and tell you, your phone will ring and say, hey, you better go to the doctor now and <laughs> take care. That's a wild one. It, that was that actually cool? on my list. I'm glad you talked about that. Yeah. Pre-alerted that you're, uh, you'll have a heart attack in two weeks. Yeah. Um, let, so I want to ask you about two others, and then I want to talk a little bit about the privacy implications yep. of all this, and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. Okay. The Internet of Things. So you talked about that at the beginning, right. and, and certainly you've been a, uh, it's been an important part of the vision that you've been talking about. How do you define a world in which there is an internet of things that are all interconnected? I mean, I think the main thing is that the world will have sensing and interactivity just distributed everywhere. So the fact that, you know, you, we come in here and we can't control the projector and the screens, we wear special microphones to talk to the speakers, uh, people come in, they can't download content associated with this right away. I mean, they can't actually even really engage with each other. You know, it, it should be that if you have sets of people that you know and you're willing to interact with, you ought to just be able to share their information back and forth with them. And so, I mean, you know, it's got implications across a huge number of industries. We already talked about healthcare, education, I think, is going to dramatically change. Obviously, we're doing stuff in automotive already. You can see cars being more connected, and, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in Silicon Valley around. Uh, around automotive and, and, and connectivity and, and so forth. Um, you know, it's just a broad, broad range of things. Your house is going to be very connected. I, you know, I live in a software controlled house, but it was all done in a very custom fashion. I had to do a lot of work to make that happen and spend you know, extra money to do it, but it shouldn't be that way. And I sort of felt at the time I was right, I was just a little too early when I was building this house and, and doing that. But now you're already starting to see people building you know, light bulbs that you can control and locks and cameras and, you know, just all sorts of stuff. So I think all those things will happen. Um, you, know, you know, going on to a little bit on the privacy issue, you know, when we first put GPS into the mm -hmm. phone, people said, oh, this is this great advertising opportunity. Uh, when I walk by a fast food restaurant, they're going to be able to send me a coupon when I walk by. And I said, you know, I don't believe that because I don't think I'm going to want to tell that fast food restaurant where I am all the time so that they know right when I'm walking by to send me, a, send me a coupon. And so we've actually been working on things to allow you to get offers from a retail establishment, but not necessarily disclose that it's you. You might disclose nothing. You might disclose you have a certain set of interests. Or if you're willing to check in and you have a loyalty program, you might be able to say, okay, yeah, it's me. 
And there's technologies to preserve anonymity in, in these kinds of things. So, so I think that's actually going to be important, that there's going to be all this stuff sort of offering services and content and offers to you. And you want to either be able to accept it or drop it on the floor. You want to be able to deal with notifications very simply and not be overly bugged by them and so forth. So I, I think in the, this world of internet of everything and, and, and sort of this digital sixth sense, I mean, it's going to be very important that we have a continuous sort of interaction model, whether it's an audio, glasses, watches. You know, I, I'm not sure what consumers are going to adopt, and I'm not sure that any one consumer is going to, you know, define, or any one method is going to define what everybody does. The, the brain initiative. So uh, the White House has announced this initiative uh, that is sort of similar to mapping the human genome. You were there for the announcement. I know that brain research generally is a very important part of what you're interested in. Talk a little bit about this intersection between communication science and neuroscience and how you're thinking about it. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is that the information in your brain seems to be encoded in the interconnectivity. So it is, in some sense, a communications problem. And it's really about how these spikes come down between one neuron and another, the length of the pathway, and then the weighting when it gets there to generate the signal that goes on after that. And so we actually started thinking about it, you know, how do we simulate this and how do we build the chips that would actually enable that? And so we're, we're in the process of doing that. And the guys, you know, when they first brought me the idea and they showed me they built an artificial retina and they modeled it so that the cells did basically what the cells in your retina do. And they said, look at this, it's really cool. They respond to these optical illusions the same way your eye does. And I said, okay, I kind of get that because I can see from these local properties that maybe that would happen. Mm. So then they put another layer of cells behind it and it started to detect edges and corners and things like that. They put another layer and it started to detect orientations and features that were together and then it detected patterns. And then after a while they you know, showed me a picture of a moth flying around in a bell jar and it, the thing just kept putting an X wherever the moth went. And I got a little freaked out by that. And then they built a little robot that was like a bird, and it was on a, on, a, on a camera on a little robot, and if you were standing in its field of view and you moved, it looked at you. And now we're doing things like you know, making things walk and making you know, arms move around obstacles, and you don't, you don't actually program these things. You just show it. And you say, yes, you did it right, or no, you did it wrong. So you reinforce, or what, what's the opposite of reinforce, uh, diminish. The, you know, the, the weightings uh, based on that. And, and we actually build these things based on biological systems. So this, the way the cells are organized are actually come from neuroscientists who are studying the way the, the brain actually works. And, and is, is there an end point to this? Is there a point at which something happens and you say, okay, that's it, that's the thing we were shooting for? You mean when the Terminator shows up and guns me down? Well, it could be that. Oh. Uh, no, I think we're already on the way. I mean, we have things that are already useful that can track objects and stuff like that. And, you, you know, the way I look at it, it's similar to a, you know, a robot today which does mechanical tasks. You yes. know. So this will do mental tasks that human beings find boring and don't want to do. And, or, you know, we're, we're actually looking right now at the ability to connect it up to the brain itself and see whether we can decode, for example, the, the subconscious things that are going on, you know, the, the, the part of your nervous system that you're not conscious of that actually is monitoring how your body works and, and so forth. So we're looking at all sorts of possibilities because it does use the same kind of spike signaling the way that your brain, your nervous system does. Mm -hmm. And so it's very conceivable to me that we can do those kinds of things. Now, a lot of people are talking about, you know, much more invasive things of, you know, getting sensors inside your skull and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not, I don't know whether, I don't know how that's going to play out. I mean, I think maybe for certain people, of course, that have certain diseases, yeah, there'll be more invasive things. I, you know, I've tended to think that the less invasive, the better, but it's really not clear to me where we head, you know, as a species. I mean, maybe, maybe Star Trek's right, and you're not a Star Trek fan, but the Borg, yeah, you know, I, I do know. know the Borg, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, who knows where, where we head because once you, once you start off accepting that you'll have technology inside your body to detect a heart attack two weeks ahead of time or accepting that you're going to have technology that's going to help you when you start forgetting faces and things like that, I mean, I'm, I don't know what the end point is. Mm. 
And I actually think that's, you know, those kinds of debates are, are valuable. Hmm. And we're, we're heading to the place already, well, you see a thing like Watson winning Jeopardy, you know. We're heading to a place already where we have to start thinking about these things from a mental standpoint, things that we used to not, we used to accept they were just uniquely human. Mm -hmm. Maybe they aren't. We have a version of Watson here uh, in our gallery downstairs. It always wins. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now questions from the audience. I love the fact that someone thought to send up a question about the impact of Moore's Law. I'd love to get your opinion on that. So much of what the museum represents is built on that. Where do you think we are in the evolution of Moore's Law and how much further can that law hold up? Okay, so let me start off with a, with a precursor to that, which okay. is Qualcomm is based on Moore's Law in this sense. When Irwin had Linkabit, we could, they all knew digital communications theory, um, but it was so expensive to do the computation that it was only used for military and space applications. And it wasn't that we consciously thought about it in Qualcomm, but it turned out that Moore's Law brought the cost of computation down that we could use it for commercial and consumer applications. So really, in a very fundamental way, Moore's Law created the opportunity that created Qualcomm. Okay, so now we're far down the path. We're 28 nanometer chips and going to 20 and 16 and 14 and 10 and 7 and all these things. And for us, um, you know, we, we don't own our own fabs, so we're fabless. Most of our um, chips are built by TSMC in Taiwan. Um, and what we see from an economic standpoint, if you talk to the memory guys who are a little bit farther ahead in some of these things, you know, you can start to see some of it slow down a little bit economically. Now, we know how to know. Um, yeah, I guess we know how to get to smaller and smaller feature sizes. Um, obviously, at some point that ends because you get down to, you know, there's not enough atoms left and you got to do something completely different. Um, but we are seeing from an economic standpoint it's slowing down. And I do worry that that means that this whole driver of the economy of the world where value was created because the tech industry could give you better performance at the same or lower price over and over and over for decades on end, um, you know, you worry about that. Now, there's an amazing amount of ingenuity out there and people are working at these problems and so, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think the game's over yet, but we're at least worried about it You right can now. see it from here. Yeah, you can see it from here. And, and I will say also, in an analogy to wireless, we hit a limit in wireless, which is, you know, Shannon calculated how, much, how many bits you could get through a certain channel. And when we realized that we had done all the fancy tricks we knew how to do, that Moore's Law allowed us to do, um, and we couldn't really improve any given radio link a lot better, we turned to different things. We turned to what's called small cells and densification of the network and getting the network and the device closer to each other and re you know, massive, massive amounts of of reuse. And I think the same thing's going to happen on the chip side, that if we can't make a cheaper transistor, um, then we'll do different things. We'll re-architect the system. We'll do different packaging things. We'll do three-dimensional. I mean, other, other ways of attacking the economic problem will come to the fore. And then you'll use the smallest transistor geometries for the thing that you really have to use them for. And you'll use early, you know, cheaper nodes for for other parts mm -hmm. of the system. Okay. Your strategy to make wireless technology accessible to developing countries, that's the next question. Could you please talk about that? Yeah, so we, um, you know, you, you typically thought in the tech industry that you build stuff at the high end and it trickles down and finally gets its way down low enough that it gets to an emerging economy. Now, with us, you know, they're talking about 7 billion smartphones to be sold between 2012 and 2017. More than half of those will come out of emerging markets. In order to do that, we got to drive the cost down dramatically and we got to get the performance. So we actually don't just trickle down. We actually build architectures for the low end of the market. So we invest sort of high end for new stuff, driving the technology forward and low end for packaging and integration and bringing some of these features immediately down to the low end so that you can bring the latest technology. I mean, India is launching LTE TDD, you know, the fourth generation, one of the new fourth generation standards. India's already launched it. So you talk about leapfrogging. I mean, they're, they're already ahead of most of the developed world 
uh, with that technology. So we have to give them cheap chips to make cheap smartphones so that all of those, uh, all those people who don't have access right now can get access. You know, they say there's 6.6, .6, something like that, billion mobile connections right now. But if you look behind that, some of those are multiple subscriptions, and there's probably 3, 3.3, 3.5 billion people who have, um, who actually have a unique, you know, unique people who have subscriptions. Um, so there's still a long way to go. But you do see cell phones really proliferated out in, into the world. I mean, they say that, you know, there's more, more cell phones out there than there are toothbrushes, so it's kind of interesting. You don't really want to talk face to face, so a cell phone is good for that. <laughs> So here's an interesting question. Why don't we have one international standard for cellular service? Sh should we? Will we? Is that ever going to be resolved? Uh, I mean, you know, it, I kind of told a little bit of the stories behind, you know, the rivalries in the industry exactly. that caused a lot of this to happen. And in fact, it's even to the point where it's very geopolitical. I mean, countries want to own things. And, um, you know, in third generation, China tried to do their own supposedly their own standard um, for 3G. And, and uh, so, I mean, it, it's, there's too much money at stake. It was, the, it was something like $1.5 trillion worth of revenues in the, uh, in the mobile industry. It's something like 2% of, of world GDP is in the mobile industry. So huge, huge amounts of money at stake. And I think that's what causes it. Now, when we look at 4G, you know, a lot of people have coalesced around uh, what's called LTE, long-term evolution, which turned out not to be so long-term. It actually turned out to happen relatively quickly. Um, and the United States really was, uh, was leader in, in 4G. So, um, so there's a lot of people coalescing around that. But of course, now you have to have backward compatibility to not just all the flavors of 3G, but all the flavors of 2G and these kinds of things. So I think for a long time to come, we're going to have multi-mode. But on the other hand, the modem's taking up less and less of the silicon of the chip. So it's not that big of a deal. The big deal really now is trying to deal with all the different frequency bands, getting a radio that really goes across all of those. And that's something that we just recently have introduced products around. And that, that's actually the harder part. To your point about what LTE originally stood for, I heard someone remark that it actually now stands for later today evolution. Things yeah. are moving so quickly. <laughs> Um, I'd love to an ask more questions from the audience, but I'm going to ask you two final questions uh, myself. One is, I mentioned the Jacobs Center a bit earlier, and I'd like for you to talk about that and what you believe it represents in the way engineering and a broad education needs to happen today. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah, so the reason why we did it was I really had the strong sense, well, first of all, education is hasn't changed for so long. I mean, you get teachers standing up in front of a class, reciting from notes that they wrote seven years ago or whatever, and you know they're not that excited about it anymore, and the students really aren't that excited about it anymore. And you really, you know, you can get the lectures online. And so we want to flip the classroom around. And what I really also felt was they're not, the students, they get the sense that software can iterate. Because, you know, everybody talks about that. I write the program, I put it out on the web, I see how people interact with it, I change it, I update it. They don't really have the same sense for hardware. And hardware with 3D printing technologies and all these kinds of things, you can do that on hardware too now. And I wanted the students to get that sense. So we're going to flip the classroom around, we're going to build this new building that's, it's six studio, six studio labs. And Kids are going to go in there, and they're going to be able to build a project around something. And the other thing I wanted to solve was, you know, people talk about shortcomings of the educational system. I just did. But actually, part of the problem is motivation, that we don't motivate people enough to go through the hard work of getting a STEM education. You know, it's easy. And I can, can't tell you the number of times I have, you know, kids of friends of mine who are real smart kids and they start out in engineering, they're like, ah, oh, you know, I want to go off into the business side. And I'm like, look, just learn the engineering part first and then you can do the business stuff later. And, you know, that's what I did and it worked out fine. So you can do that kind of stuff. <laughs> and, and engineering, you know, it helps you think a certain way and you should learn that and get a skill set that's really, really good for you. So I want to motivate people. And I believe strongly, because it worked for me, that 
if you let them build something that's cool and it's like a commercial product, which you can do these days, and then that engineer goes home and shows their buddies that they built this really cool thing, then the buddies are going to be jealous that, and they're going, to go, they're going to think that person's cool instead of saying, oh, that's the guy who off in the corner in the library all the time studying and stuff. They're going to actually see, yeah, you can make real things in the real world and actually understand how they work. And to me, that will be very, very motivational. And I'd love to see us get you know, more women into engineering, more underrepresented minorities into engineering. I think doing things that make it feel cool that you actually build stuff and you actually literally change the world and bring something out of your head into reality, I think that will do it. And so that's a big piece of it as well. Okay. So my last question then is related to this. In this very large audience tonight, we have these 160 students who are here on the uh, program at Stanford this summer. If you were going to give them advice, tonight, what advice would you give them? So beside the advice that I just gave, I would say I mean, the number one thing that helped me in my life was pushing, out, pushing myself outside of my comfort zone. I mean, you see me up here talking today naturally. I, I used to be the world's worst public speaker. I was nervous, I was fidgeted, and I just forced myself to do it over. And now, you know, I do live TV all the time. I'm fine with that and, and so forth. And, and that's you know, that's public speaking, but it's true of almost anything I've done in my life. I always, I would always take a risk to say, okay, I don't really know if we can pull this off, but let's go try and let's go focus in on it and, and make the effort and, and don't just give up when the first obstacle happens. You know, just have a few plans like, okay, this might happen. It's like the compass analogy I gave earlier. You know, it's not like you have a map that says, here's all the roads you're going to follow. It's you, ha you know the direction and try and find that direction. And so I would say the number one thing is just don't let yourself settle back and say life is good and you know we live in this wonderful place and all these good things are coming to me and I'm just going to live live off of that. You know it's it's great to be able to change the world. It's great to push yourself beyond the things you think you can do and that's I would say my number one piece of advice. Paul Jacobs, thank you very much for the time you spent with us tonight. Thanks.